it's another instance of government pricing you out of the market. And jobs go somewhere else. Investment goes somewhere else. Risk taking goes somewhere else. And on down the line. So the first thing we need to focus on as people concerned about business and jobs is to make sure we have a cost structure in our country that is competitive and improving, not uncompetitive and getting worse. And I had lunch not long ago with a 35-year-old entrepreneur. He said, Governor, I got more money I know what to do with. I made a fortune in oil and gas in North Dakota. And he said, I don't want to get out of business. I'm 35 years old. I got ideas. I got energy. I want to be a venture capitalist. I want to be an angel investor. But you know what I'm doing right now? This was before the November elections. He said, I'm not doing anything. He said, the reason I'm not doing anything is because I don't have the belief, I don't have the confidence that this, this president and the then pelosi reed Congress have any understanding or respect or appreciation for private markets and entrepreneurs. What they're telling me is my taxes may well go up. What they're telling me is my health care costs are going up. What they're telling me is I may have to have my employees subjected to not voting about their worker rights in private, but doing it peer-to-peer -peer in a peer pressure environment. They're telling me that my energy costs may go up as they threatened cap and tax or cap and trade uh, back in those months. And he said, I'm not deploying money into that environment. It's hostile. It's discouraging. It's uncertain. I don't have confidence in it going forward. So all of that is to say we need to do those things as a first priority that will make it more likely that jobs are going to grow here, not somewhere else. And that starts with making sure the cost structure, the competitiveness structure of this country is getting better, uh, not worse. Now, the second thing is kind of complicated. I know it's late and you had a big meal and the evening's going on, so I'm going to try to say this one slowly because it's hard, hard to comprehend this one, I think, for some, but I think you'll get it if I say it slowly. Are you ready? Here it is. We can't spend more than we take in. You know it in your families. You know it in your businesses. You just, we just have to get the government to follow the same principle. It is not that hard. The federal government last year took in about $2.2 trillion. They spent $3.5 trillion. They overshot it by $1.5 trillion in one year. There are trillion dollar or so deficits as far as the eye can see. And we have a federal government that is currently now unable to meet its bills, pay its bills, unless they again raise the debt ceiling. So we have to, as a country, before this thing goes any further down the road, hold our leaders accountable for living within their means just like you have to do every day. They have to set priorities. They're going to have to get rewarded for saying not just yes to everybody all the time, but for saying no, and they have to live within a budget. Now, people say, oh, man, this is hard. You know, the interest groups are there, the politics, or the whatever. Look, you're, you're looking at somebody who governed as a conservative in Minnesota. Uh, this is the land of, and I love my state. It's a beautiful state filled with wonderful people. But politically, it bends pretty hard the other way. I mean, it is the land of Eugene McCarthy and Walter Mondale and Hubert Humphrey and Paul Wellstone and now United States Senator Al Franken. Um, <laughs> but even in this state, we bent the spending curve dramatically during my time as governor. It wasn't easy. I set a record for vetoes. Uh, we had the first government shutdown in 150-year history of my state. We had a, a personally unallotted almost $3 billion out of the budget in one biennium, one budget term uh, in my uh, time. We had a whole bunch of special sessions. I took a 44-day transit strike and shut down the whole transit system for a month and a half because our bus drivers thought they should be able to work 15 years and then have the government pay for their health insurance for the rest of their lives after they retired after working just 15 years. All of those things had to change. And so we drew some lines in the sand and fought hard, and we prevailed. Now, this next and last one is, uh, 
I think really encapsulates most of what we have to do beyond the two that I just mentioned. Now, if you have time and you can stay up late and watch cable TV, great. You can get good information from that. If you can go to seminars or read white papers or attend the meetings of think tanks, that's fantastic. But I know you're really busy and you've got lives and jobs and careers and businesses to run. So I'm just going to try to net it out for you because I think just about everything you need to know about government reform boils down to one principle, whether it's schools or health care or anything else. And it's this. People spend money differently if it's their own money. Now, if you don't believe me, go to two weddings. Go to one wedding where there's an open bar, where the refreshments are all free. Go to another wedding where there's a cash bar. You will t see two very different sets of behavior. <laughs> now, I said this in New York a couple weeks ago, and this gentleman yelled out. He said, well, who even has a cash bar at weddings anymore? I didn't have the heart to tell him that in Minnesota. We still have the dollar dance to help raise money for the bride and groom <laughs> as we send them off onto their new life together. The government has been running itself as an open bar for too long. Any system where people get to consume th stuff without knowledge about price or quality, without any accountability for using it wisely and choosing and making wise decisions, and that same system has no incentives for the provider to do anything other than to provide volume, that's a system that's doomed to fail. Unfortunately, that's most of government. We have to have systems where consumers and purchasers are in charge or more in charge. They have to have user-friendly, available information about price and quality. They have to be given financial incentives to make wise decisions about what they're consuming and whether those are good choices. The providers have to be given incentives other than seniority and volume to provide a strategic outcome or outcome that we want. Let me give you one example of all of this in uh, health care. The answer to health care is not to take the problem and drag it into Washington, D.C. and create a new, top-down, one-size-fits-all, mindless bureaucracy envisioned by bureaucrats, staffed by government employees uh, with an image or myth that it's all going to be free or mostly free. That is a system that I guarantee you will be in trouble within 15 years or sooner. And it's a bad idea to begin with. The answer to health care reform is you have to get consumers and purchasers in the driver's seat. We have to give them good information about price and quality. We have to give the providers incentives other than volume to make people better and healthier. And now let me give you one rudimentary example of this from Minnesota. We said to our state employees, hey, look, you can get your health care wherever you want. But if you go somewhere that's more expensive and has less or poorer outcomes, you're going to pay more. And if you go somewhere that is more efficient with higher quality, you'll pay less. Guess where they go? Vast majority of public employees shifted their health care choices to higher quality, uh, equally lower, co lower cost, more efficient providers and the cost in the program has been substantially under market uh, for seven, eight years in a row. I mean, it's a terrific result, even in a very primitive form of the reform. So these kinds of changes can and will work. I want to just close by telling you none of this is going to be easy. We have to have people in these positions, and thankfully you have that now in Iowa, and uh, we have that now more in Minnesota than perhaps in many recent years or decades. But none of this is going to be easy, but it can be done. It can be done. You know, Valley Forge wasn't easy. Uh, settling the West was not easy. Winning World War II was not easy. Going to the moon, for sure, wasn't easy. But if prosperity were easy, everybody around the world would be prosperous. And if freedom were easy, everybody around the world would be free. And if security were easy, everybody around the world would be secure. But they're not. 
we are and we have been and we can be in the future if we rise up, are willing to tell the truth about how we got into this mess, point out not just the problem but reasonable ways to get out of it, and have a positive forward-looking attitude going forward. We can do this. As, again, this is a great country. It is filled with great people who are strong and courageous and smart and entrepreneurial and dynamic. And if we join together, we can make great progress. And your Chamber of Commerce in this city, in this state, is a terrific example of Americans coming together, Iowans coming together to say, we have some pretty good ideas about what will work and we're going to hold our politicians and our elected officials accountable for getting it done and making the situation better, not worse. So I thank each and every one of you for being involved. I hope you'll stay involved. You've doubled this thing, or nearly so, and in the last couple of years, and I hope you double it again in the next couple of years. And thank you for having me tonight, and thank you for listening.